Well, look here, y'all. It doesn't matter what kind of tag you have in your pocket this season. If you're not hunting cow elk, you need to listen to what I'm about to say real close. I mean, real, real close. Because it's like that EF Hutton thing, right? I'm about to give you a huge tip. If you aren't hunting cow elk, well, you should be. We've been getting emails from listeners about hunting cow elk, and we totally get it. It seems that our focus is on hunting bulls, but buddies and budettes, except for that late season, which we'll talk about as well, here's a little secret. It really doesn't matter if you have a bull, a spike, or a cow elk tag in your pocket. If you want to be successful at finding any of those critters, you had better be hunting for those cows. Not sure what we mean by that? Well, let's just have a little conversation about it. Those topics along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com with your host, Gilbert Ornelas and Elk Hunting Coach Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Grinders tuning in, thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our Base Camp Training Camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And Base Camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of the show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and one of my good friends from Katy, Texas, Luis Gonzalez, and none other than Manuel Graterón. The Venezuelan Mafia is in the house from Big D, DFW area, <laughs> Dallas, Texas. What's going on? And don't look now. We just had a, a new elk coach sighting in New Mexico from Cimarron. We've got your <laughs> elk hunting coaches Joe Gillian, Leroy Chav Chavez. What's and, going on, uh, fellas? Man, oh, wow, here, here from, popu from popular demand is 
my nano gratteron, man. Hey, <laughs> <roll. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so the big I'm M and the little G in the house tonight. <laughs> Is there any way you guys can like arm wrestle through through the screen or something, man? Because <laughs> if there was right. a way, he would lose. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to know. All right, there's two things they want to know. They were like, "Okay, so can you tell us about what is this Venezuela mafia?" First of all, right? Yeah, that's like, the. Oh, yeah, we can't tell you, man. If we told you, we'd have to kill you, right? <laughs> so, secondly, they're like, "Well, really, who is the true leader of the Venezuela mafia?" <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, come on, answer that emotion. question, guys. I'll let my no, no, I don't that. wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna answer that question because that's gonna lead me to. I know, I mean, another fight with Luis. Yeah. I, I don't want, I don't wanna fight with which you would argument. lose. <laughs> there you go. You see, I mean, that's <laughs> what it's now. A I, it's so good to see you this evening, counselor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Yes, sir. <laughs> so the only thing is this, though, Manano, man. You say it would just lead to another fight with Luis. Now, I have had the pleasure of spending from before daylight till all day long after dark. And I have managed to hear. And way into the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> Laying on a rock pile, gutting it out. <laughs> I have managed to hear uh, arguments discussions debates conversations <laughs> over things as little as which way the wind is blowing uh, <laughs> where's the elk sounding the, from the, the the weight of a pack whether or not joe uh hit the elk behind the shoulder above the shoulder uh <laughs> I, I mean it, about having a shirt tucked in or not tucked in man <laughs> and then to, and what's so cool and then to, to see the culmination of all of that machismo right and everything else culminate into when luis killed that bull the best part of that whole video was the aftermath of that shot of them two brothers embracing oh, and taking man, no care kidding. of one another. I mean, look, these guys put on a big show and they do argue like cats and dogs, man, but I'm <laughs> telling you, they love one another beyond belief. And, and yeah. uh, like, I, you know, we talk about guys to ride the river with. These are two of the finest <clears throat> men I've ever met in my life. So, yeah. you know, Make thank me you emotional guys for being there, part. Beto. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Second to that. Yeah, it, uh, it, absolutely, man. And, you know, it, it's almost like uh, Siamese twins that are attached to each other and can't get away from each other sometimes. <laughs> and, and, you know, when it comes right down to it, I mean, you guys give each other so much digging and so much stuff. And, I it's mean, we beautiful. all do that, right? But, yeah. you know, I, I have seen the, the pure love of you guys, man, the brotherhood. Oh, yeah. and, and, and Gilbert's right. You know, when Manano got his bull – um, when Luis got his bull, I, I don't think when Manano got his, the happiest person that was there was Luis no and, doubt. and yep. vice versa, man. And yep. I mean, later on now, after, after the emotion and, and moment was over, sure. <laughs> sure. Was yeah, the different. shit talking started. <laughs> <laughs> Use <Yeah>. my French. <laughs> I think, look, it's, uh, it's a very interesting relationship and, One and moment. I'll say this because, uh, yeah, I, I always thought the world of Manana, right? And uh, I hope he's not listening. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's just that I, I think t true friendship is founded in the fact that um, you can tell that person anything, anything, uh, whether that person is going to like it or not. And that person is going to know that whatever's coming from the other person is not coming, coming with bad intentions. It's coming yeah, with no the malice. best of intentions, even yeah. if it's coming out wrong the wrong way. Sure. And uh, and then knowing that that's the case, if you know the other person's true intentions and those are good intentions, it doesn't matter what you tell to each other. It doesn't matter how it, it just, you know, I, I, the, the way that uh, things sharpen is two sharp things hitting each other. And I think that's yeah. kind of the relationship I'm, I'm and I have. Yeah. It's just, you know, we we are constantly looking at each other and trying to um make the other person better and and we're just open to that so we know our arguments one <laughs> provide entertainment at camp and two it just make makes our friendship stronger and uh i know i can count on him uh 
and and I hope he does know that he can count on me too for whatever it is. You know, oh, he's so. shaking his head. No, I I, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it, Luis. But I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because I haven't. This is just uh, for the show, by the story. way. A, yeah, I know yeah. that. But it's <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe is, is recording it. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll keep it. But my, I mean, Luis, uh, I met Luis by phone. <laughs> the, first, the very first time I called him and, and my wife she was I mean she kept telling me call Luis he's my cousin and he's a hunter and I learned that he was a, a you know skeet uh, shooter, shooter. Mm -hmm. with, with, with shotguns and I I mean I had I mean at least two years telling my wife I don't hunt with those kind of guys I hunt alone <laughs> for two years. Oh, oh, I mean, honestly, I'm telling the whole truth. For two years. And, and, and she kept telling me and telling me, please, call Luis. I, I, mean, right. I mean, he's a great <laughs> guy. And, and he's so amazing. And he's a good hunter. And, and, and well, I've seen him did. shoot the bow, so it was a good thing he shot the shotgun so he could hit something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so, I, so I call him. I call him and I say, hey, Luis, this is Manuel Gateron. I'm Manano, and, uh, and I'm calling because Anna told me <laughs> to call you because you are a hunter, uh, but I hunt, I'm a bow hunter. If you want to hunt with me, you have to buy a bow, and, and I'm going to tell you what kind of bow, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to meet you right on the public land X day, I said. And he said, okay. And, and two days after that call, he just texts me, what is the brand of the, and the model of the, of the bow you want me to buy? And I text him back, and, and, and I said, okay, this kind of bow, blah, 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 blah. And he texts me back like five minutes later, and I got him. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> I'll see you at 3 a.m. On, right on the, on the gate on the public land in Waco. And he was living in, in Oklahoma. It was like five, almost so, so, so all the listeners are wanting to know exactly where this hunting spot is located, man. So <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. It's, we can share. We don't go there anymore. No yeah, it's like an hour and a half uh, from Dallas, and uh -huh. he was living in Oklahoma. And, wow. um, and I so, said, okay, right. I'll see you at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., I believe, right on the gate at the – a2 area down there in Waco, and he was freaking there <laughs> at 4 a.m. o'clock sharp, and I was late. <laughs> I was late. What's new? <laughs> yeah. What's oh, that's, new? that's started the relationship yeah. right there, man. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, that's it's where it's it all started. Same ever since, man. Yeah, I was late, and, uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, it was so fun, and, and um. And and yeah. I love you, buddy. I love you. I truly love you. <laughs> I know. I know. Awesome, man. Awesome. And, you know, I, I hunted with him for a couple of years, and he would tell me about you. And I'm like, you know, I got to meet this dude because, you know, my my by my background and my heritage is Latin, right? So usually when these guys make a friend and and uh, and they're good friends, there's people that you want to be around, you know. Yeah. So I told him, I said. Look, man, if he's a friend of yours, he's a friend of mine, side unseen. Let's let's meet this cat. And I'm telling you, one of the best men I ever met in my life. So welcome, Manano. Thank, thank you, Ben. And, and, and most thank most you. people don't know, man, just uh God, I mean, this guy came in just wanting to cook at camp. Yeah. And uh like unbelievable, man. I mean, uh I, yeah. Chav and I, we always look forward to elk hunting season because we, yeah. we would lose weight. Man. Yeah, we used to lose weight. Yeah, we, we used to Not lose anymore. weight. We came home after that first year, Chav jumped Gain on the scale pounds. after we killed our aunt. And we came in just for, in the middle. I think, uh, Luis, uh, we had to bring some elk down, remember? And, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Chav's like, I've gained two pounds. 
yeah, yeah. Taking yeah. two, three times, three dumps a day, man. Ooh, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, that dude crazy. can. And look, these boys can cook, y'all. Let me let me tell you. When oh, he said he wanted to come and cook, I, I was like, man, dude, you don't understand. They just work horses, you know, because uh, you are tired after you're done and stuff well, like it. It's it's a lot of work. These know? guys are like, so Joe, if 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 we come to elk camp is is it okay if we bring the food and if we can cook i'm like hmm let me think uh, about yeah. This one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah buddy oh i thought God. you know hey man i had a guy who's gonna come cook for us last year i thought my nano was gonna lynch my ass so, uh, uh-uh, no way it ain't happening uh, it happen. the only downside to us cooking is that we we miss some of the conversations some of the elk stories that start because yeah. they sit down we start cooking and we're like hey y'all don't talk about it yet yeah exactly wait, be wait quiet, for us be to quiet. sit down we exactly. want in on this exactly. conversation dude hey, we'll would do hear a better we'll you do would a better hear it job if you that. weren't arguing over what you put in the food and <laughs> how much and that's, yeah. that's oh true God. too but you got to give us some room for we argument, will so I, you know we'll, we'll sell well, we'll that, spend that's... 30 minutes of talking into it. It's well, going to be right. a little dull for about 30 that, minutes. That's the you. point when I offer Beto a little frangelico. I'm in. To, I'm, in. I'm in. Just to I'm redo in. the conversation. And hey, that's a perfect back. segue to let's get this party started, man. Absolutely. Let's get this right. started. Yes, sir. Well, you guys know what time it is. Shout out. Shout, shout out. Shout time shout for the El Bro shout, shout out. Shout out. Guys, if you're new to the show, these are just shout outs to some of the cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. That's right. And we're going to hit those grinders first for giving us those incredible reviews out there. Steve Puckett from Frankfort, Kentucky. Steve Steve says he loves listening to us, man, because it's been helping him through that honeydew list. <laughs> he's, like, yeah. he's got that cranking. Taylor from Southern Oregon and Chris Bernard from southeast mississippi and chris says he did not draw a tag this year but he will be wearing the vacu camo to chase deer over there in heck mississippi, yeah chris awesome. absolutely and for our top listening cities if you have any trouble guys finding any of these cities or finding your way in the elk woods base map pro is the gps app for the elk bros crew and for all our grinders looking for what we always are looking for, an incredible deal. You can get 20% off a base map pro subscription just by using the promo code ELKBROS20, E-L-K-B-R-O-S-2-0. And here's the deal, man. It covers all 50 states. That's that will awesome. be 24 bucks for all 50 states, and which is beyond an incredible deal, man. All yeah. of that for that promo code for only twenty four, and and you got to check out the the little the little game they have to where you uh you have to uh, the gear drop yeah, find gear the drop. gear drop that yeah. they they do every week where you can win prices for that super fun. Player hate the game, Joe. That's right. <laughs> All right, our top listening city. Okay, we'll jump off with the first one, with a long history of rubber and tire manufacturing. Carried on today by the Goodyear Tire Company, this city is nicknamed the rubber capital of the world. But it was the legacy of Dr. Bob Smith, a local icon, that had rippled through the lives of so many. Dr. Bob was a physician and surgeon that battled alcoholism his entire life. He teamed with Dr. Bob Wilson and helped over 5,000 alcoholics before his death. It was these two men that in 1935 formed Alcoholics Anonymous that has continued to help thousands fight their disease. A big shout out to Acre- Akron, Akron, Ohio. Yeah, Akron. Yeah. You know, what better Valley. legacy for somebody to take a weakness and a disease and recognize yeah. it that and turn that into a positive to help other people and uh, his legacy. Mm uh has lived on and and man helped how many people millions of people ever yep. since that so that's way cool awesome located inside the jurisdiction of the city of houston this community was once the lands of the atacapa and Acoquisa indians before the appearance of german settlers in 1840 But in the fight for Texas, it was also here that General Sam Houston and his Texas Army camped just days before the Battle of San Jacinto. And this is for Cypress, Texas. 
Cypress, Texas. In Cypress, the house. Texas in the house. Home of Ty Lothringer, my cousin. <clears throat> oh, really? Yes, hey, sir. Ty, and big I, shout and out. A little Ty, shameless, Ty. And a little shameless plug for Skeeter's Automotive. <laughs> <laughs> Ty, that'll be 65 bucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> He'll say, bill me. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, claim to be... The steer wrestling capital of the world, our next top listening city, was named after Samuel Chicote, the first chief of the Creek Nation elected after the Civil War. Home to the Civil War battlefield, early settlers called it the gem of the prairie. Although named for Samuel Chicote, it's spelled C-H-E-C-O-T-E. It was the misspelling of a map maker that labeled the name phonetically, and the name has remained the same ever since. Chicota, Oklahoma. And that's yes, Chicota. C-O-T-A-H. Yep, Chicota, Oklahoma. So, Oklahoma, Carrie Cota. Underwood. <laughs> so Carrie you, Underwood. You guys, it's who? Carrie who? Underwood. Carrie Underwood. Chicota, Oklahoma, yes, sir. Oh, well, I'll be darned. And, yep. and and it's you one person's Chicota is another one's Chicota, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying how the Oklahoma people do, you know, I've worked up there in the oil field and they call it Chicota. Oh, cool. Well I, guys, man, Oklahoma, guys think from there. Absolutely. Guys, this next top listening city is located just south of the foothills of San Gabriel Mountains and was the Mexican land grant given to a dedicated soldier politician and smuggler named Tiberico Tapia. You might expect um, uh, the mountains or the smuggler to bury a box of treasure and the stories of Tapia's treasures go like this. Worried in 1845 about the escalating conflict between Mexico and the U.S., Tapia secretly buried most of his smuggler's fortune. The great smuggler, not so great trapper, but after burying his treasure, <laughs> He, he used his knife to lace a cattle carcass with poison to kill coyotes, harassing his herd. <laughs> oh my Problem goodness. was, he never cleaned the poison from his knife and cut off some of his own food with it, in turn, <laughs> poisoning himself. Oops. Uh. Died not having told anyone where the gold was buried. Double oops. Des yeah. <laughs> Despite the efforts of many treasure hunters over the years, the gold has never been found. This all happened in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Cucamonga. Let's go look for it. I, I always thought that name was just in a cartoon, man. I mean, always. <laughs> the poisoning. You know, you know, Joe. Uh, I've got some bow hunter friends of mine that they still use a product called a Necton over in Mississippi. It's still uh, they're able to use it. It's a little pod that they put it on goes their on arrow. arrow. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it hits a cloven hoofed animal in any part of the muscle, it will kill that animal uh, within, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. He's going wow. to die. He'll shut his central nervous system down. And there's been a lot of guys that have been messing with that and uh, get it on their fingers and then go take them a dip of snuff and they uh, put that dip of snuff in their mouth. It paralyzes uh, them and they die because they can't breathe. Oh, you know? it, so there's uh, been several hunters die from that stuff. Unbelievable, man. Yeah. I, I, I'd have to stay because if somebody's going to mess up and do that, it would be me. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt, man, for sure. <laughs> and I don't have to do any <clears throat> dip for that to happen, man. Manano, you're up, bro. Yeah. Where's the big old eow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, shout out, Beto. Got you, baby. Well, <laughs> this city is an is actually an island and lies in the heart of the Niagara River between the Canada and the United States. The island is the site of Manhattan, but only has a population of twenty thousand plus. The island is covered in trees, parks, incredible restaurants, trails in both marinas. The Seneca Indian tribe has also filed a lawsuit to reclaim the island. And this is for Grand Island, New York. Grand Island, New York. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, I, a lot of New Yorkers that listen, man, I, I, you awesome. see these cities from know. all over the United States. That is so cool. And, oh, I'm going to give a quick shout-out to listener Vince Nigro. Vince uh, 
requested a shout out to his hometown, one of the oldest communities of Washington State, the southern gateway of Mount St. Helens and home to the famous clogger Lilac Gardens. Woodland, Washington, and Vince. There you go, bro. A big shout out to your Woodland, town. Washington. Beautiful Thanks country up there. Man. Yep. Yeah. No uh, doubt. Oh man. Oh, my wife and I got to go through uh, Washington. We've gone through Oregon, and we just like to land and rent a car and just go through and camp. And if you're used to the, you know, it's hard to even comprehend when you have the perspective coming from New Mexico of our pine woods, <laughs> yeah, and then you drive through those highways in Washington, man. And I mean, it's like you're, it's like you're driving through a crevice in the yeah. earth of nothing but trees. And I mean, they go up 200 tall. foot up there, yeah. man. It's just, it's unbelievable, incredible, beautiful, and old forests, yep. you know. It's a gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous country, man. Yep. So let's hit our topic so we can get going for this, man. And uh, we, our first topic was inspired, again, from our listeners. A uh, question from Ben Dixon of Franklin, Tennessee, and Tim Cordova of Colorado Springs. And both Ben and Tim, um, these guys are going to be cow elk hunting this year. Ben's going to be hunting in September. Tim, right around October 10th, I believe is what it is. And both these guys listen to our podcast and they said that when they listen, they hear a lot about bulls, but not so much about cows. And, you know, that really got me thinking because I answered both these guys, you know, sent back. And, and I know they're going to be listening for this. I, I told them to listen. We'll be answered on here. But the reason that I thought this was so cool to answer and then people asked about and saying that we're not talking about hunting cows is I think a lot of times people really don't hear the message that we're saying. Yeah. And so what we're going to do right now, this whole show is going to be to help out those cow elk hunters, uh, but bull elk hunters too, because I'm telling you. They one and the same sometimes, Joe. Absolutely, man. Yeah. There'll be bulls where they find the cows. Yeah. You, can't, you won't find a whole lot of bulls when there ain't a lot of cows around. No, I mean, I'm, early, early, you might, you might find some bachelor groups grouped up, but Man, when this guy, when these two guys are going to be hunting September and October the tenth, October the tenth, man. Wow, you know, it'll be wild and woolly. How and often do we tell people, man, between September first and the end of October? And mm -hmm. and guys, I'm telling you this too. We're going to talk more about it. But even on into December, y'all, um, everybody should be hunting cows. Yeah. Everybody, because look, you want to find the bulls. What? What do you got to find? find the cat. Got to find the cows, cows, right? Who determines where they're going to go eat? The, the cows. cows. Cows do. It's just like, hey, you know, how many times we get to pick the restaurant, man? <laughs> Not me. <many>. Birthday. <laughs> yeah. Not too often. Yeah. On, yeah. On, on the birthday, maybe. Uh, who's yeah. going to determine where they bet? Cows. Cows are. Lead who's going to determine yeah. the route they take from Lead the feed cow, to the yeah. bed or the bed to the feed? cows yep. man cows. and who determines what bull they're going to breed with cows so <laughs> the point is that we're making is that y'all uh if you are going if you're hunting cows and you're hunting cows uh in september you know all i and i told these guys you, you know i always tell the guys with the bulls find the cows right Yep. So once those bulls start screaming, if you're hunting elk between September 1st, October 10th, how would you find a cow, Gilbert? Man, I'm telling you, you listening for them bulls bugling. You know? I mean, <laughs> golly, the first bull that bugles, whoo, hey, guess what? There's some cows around. I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. Listening for the bulls bugling and understanding where my feed and water holes are, transition areas. I mean, you're gonna when you find them, you found a gold mine. Uh, yeah. it, especially when you got like us with well, either sex tag, right? right? And for me, it's not about a bull or a cow. It's about finding an elk I can harvest. So, yeah, we're going to speak straight to these cow hunter guys. Believe me, you, uh, I do not discriminate at all. Uh, the first one that gets in front of that Matthews is getting the meat whistle. I promise you. <laughs> and, and, and it's happened before like that, right? A one hundred percent, yes, sir. First cow I ever killed, and it was not planned, but it was definitely uh, one of the most um, exhilarating, special trophies I've ever killed in my life. So, 
were you hunting cows at the time? Absolutely not. It's calling a bull in. Yeah. yeah. So tell, and tell us we how. Had been all, we had been all morning. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, this was uh, the last hunt, and it really was special. It was the last hunt of the infamous Carl Gamage uh, that he did with me and pretty much his last elk hunt uh, at all. Uh, he was my guide the whole weekend. Um, we had so much fun together and it was hard. We, we hunted, we hunted extremely hard and, uh, that guy had such a bad tore up knee and I had no clue how bad his knee was. Uh, but he had such a bad tore up knee, but he would gut it up and climb the highest peak to try to get me around a bull elk. Right. And we found a little piece of land that had some we didn't know they had any elk on it. We just <laughs> went up this big steep hill that he decided he was going to conquer and me behind him. He was dragging my fat butt with him. Uh, and we got to the top of town and have a little snort and some uh, weller. And we, we, we just sat right there. It was, it was such a beautiful morning. And all of a sudden we stand up and we start to move and I turn and look and there's a bull staring at us and some cows on my left hand side. I don't know what they were doing there because we've been there making all kind of racket and this that, and the other. I stand up and I'm telling you I hit the cow call one time and this bull stands up out of the bushes and all these cows stand up, stand up to our left and they take off and he looks at me and he goes, Oh, I be damn. You know, he was like, or that was that a whole herd of elk? I said, it damn sure was, Carl. He goes, I'll be damn. We've been sitting right here amongst them all. I mean, they were not 30 yards bedded down to our left. So we're like, okay, well, we could smell them a lot, you know, while we were bedded, while we were sitting down eating. So uh, he said, well, cow call again, man. So I cow called again and right across the little ravine. <laughs> I mean, a big bull starts bugling. And then I hear, I hear a bunch of cows calling. He goes, let's go. So we tabled off on the top of this little ridge, and we start going across the table of this little ridge, and it falls off into a real steep ravine. And, and I mean, it's, it's really steep going straight down. And uh, I look across that ravine, and I see something move kind of, you know, with that champagne color, that uh, taupe color of the side of that elk. And, I got my binoculars up and he got his up and he goes, bull, get ready, get ready. He goes, he gets his little, his little call out. Man, that bull goes crazy. I mean, the bull starts going nuts and here he comes. He's running down a fence line towards us. He's probably about 160 yards out and he's coming. He's a really beautiful bull, man. I don't know, six by six, uh-huh. real beautiful bull. He's got eight cows with him. And the cows are in front of him, and they're going down. They're coming towards his cow call. So he said, why don't you let out one of them little bugles that you got? He said, let's see what happens. I bugled just a little bugle, and that just incensed that bull. And here he come roaring down this hill. He's at about 85 yards now, and I got some overhanging limbs. And uh, he, he's got his rangefinder binoculars. He said he's at 85 yards. I said, yeah, he's walking down this ravine, you know. And uh, I turn and I look, and down in the bottom of the ravine, out walks a cow at 38 yards. <laughs> or I'm sorry, 41 yards. Walks out broadside. I mean, going daddy right here, right? <laughs> I mean, I look down there, and I looked up at him, and he goes, hmm, like that, you know, hmm. <laughs> so I just, I grabbed my bow, and I drew. And when I drew and centered it, I'm like, I can, you know, I look up and that bull's standing up there at 90 yards. You know, he's kind of hung up with them cows way up the ravine. I look back down here. I center that 40-yard pin on her. Poof! <laughs> I couldn't help myself, man. <laughs> Poof, I sent it, boy. <laughs> when it hit her, it went through her, man, and she jumped, ran back up the hill. And he liked to have fainted. He was like, oh, my God, you know, because at the time, I, you know, he thought I'm killing a bull, you know. Right, he right, had yeah. no clue that Big O was going to go ahead and ventilate that cow, right? <laughs> so he gets, to, he gets to looking with his binoculars down there, and, I mean, he is shaking like a dog trying to crap a peach seed now. I mean, you know, he is going nuts, and he says, oh, my God, he said, I think you killed that <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you know, so we had big time hugging one another and everything. He's crying. I mean, just literally crying. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And he said, that, that arrow down there is solid red, son. He said, I'm telling you, he goes, you smoked her, but you know, 
And uh, he said, uh, that bull's long gone. Don't even worry about him. I said, I ain't worried about him, man. So we sat down there for about 10 minutes and just had the biggest time talking. He goes, I thought you were just, you know, counting coup or something. He goes, I had no clue when you drew on that cow, you were going to let it go. He said, but when I heard that thing go and I watched the fletching go right behind her shoulder, he goes, I was like, Oh my God, that just happened. You know, he said, I didn't know if you meant to do it or not meant to do it. I said, Oh, hell yeah. She got in the way. I said, Big O needs some elk meat, brother. So, uh, hey, it Beto, was a big that's time. not the first time. And if you ever hunted with Beto, he'll do that stuff. You know, whenever he draws that bow, you better be ready because something ain't going to happen. Something's going to die. Something's, 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 something's going to die. die. Something's going to die. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, I was sitting with him in South Texas, one of them uh, uh, tree stands one day, and, you know, we're super quiet. It's early in the morning. It's cold, and uh, this this cold buck comes out, you know, and he's just looking at it. I look at Beto and see his intentions, and he's like, hmm, you know, he's kind of shaking his head to the side. I don't know. And then he kind of grabs a, an arrow and then he draws and I'm like, oh, should I, should I be feel poof? <laughs> there goes the arrow. Like, yeah, it's a, it was a special time. It was a special time because not only did we know that that was going to be the last elk hunt with yeah. Carl Gamage, right. uh, it was the first cow that he'd ever seen taken with a bow with his own two eyes, right? Yeah. And, uh, it was special, man. That, that cow didn't run 70 yards and she was piled up. It, and it was a perfect heart shot. The arrow actually went through the very center of that elk's heart. Yeah. And uh, when we when we butchered her, I had a really, I had a whole lot of help. I had, uh, he was, I had he Bill was so Watson. proud of that man showing that shot and stuff. He really was, he you was. know. And, I was, again, man, but we were hunting bulls and the cow got in the way. And I've had that happen a couple yeah. of times you know and, and uh for you people listening man that that was september and uh yeah. we yeah. lost carl october 16th so that yeah. year and that was a tough time for all of us and and the elk bros group that you're seeing now is a result it's a result of that man because this yeah. whole hunt that we do that uh, all of this came out of came out because we were going to honor Carl um, Gamage. Carl Gamage by being together, hunting together, telling his stories. Yes. Uh, do, I mean, and you know, when, when you hear some of the stuff that, you know, that you hear come out of Gilbert about Carl, that was Carl, man. I mean, he was, he was bigger than life. He was who he was. Um, but I tell you what, when it came down to, if you wanted anybody watching your six that was a man and he was going to do it and he would go down for you doing it and i, I, I mean, tell people all the time i'd fight hell with a water pistol with that guy at my absolutely side. and so that's what you're seeing right now what, what this group that we have together yeah. um uh the, our our entire makeup and uh, what we represent all all because we every out camp you know manano never got to meet him and luis never got to meet him but I guarantee you, both those fellas know Carl Gamage through the stories yeah. that we've told, and uh, he'll he'll always live through those yeah. stories. He'll live forever. Yeah. Yeah. One of the coolest men the I ever met in my life, man. Yeah. The only regret I had is I didn't know him when I was twenty. The yeah. stuff I could have learned from him, and he was just such a gracious guy, man. He loved life. He loved his family. He loved people. Yep. And uh, he loved them woods, brother. He loved yeah, being absolutely. in the woods. He loved chasing elk. I mean, you talking about a guy who came from absolutely nothing and just left Houston and moved to Angel Fire, New Mexico, with nothing, with absolute. So, uh, he was he's he was quite the guy, man. He was somebody to do that. Now, absolutely. speaking of cow elk and elk hunts, you know, uh, we of our group right here. You know, I had the pleasure of being with Manano, and we're almost in the same type of thing, Manano. Remember the, you know, we're chasing a bull elk. We're chasing a bull yeah, elk, and course. things are going nuts, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it was uh, it was my first experience in hunting elk. Uh, you know, to me, it's, I mean, it's not about antlers or horn. Right. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just about being out there just hunting. Uh, I mean, if you are a bow hunter, you shortly realize that uh, there's no trophy. 
you have to go after. I mean, it's just everything is a trophy. Yeah. Uh, I remember it was uh, uh, the last days, I believe. It was the last day of, of, of the hunting. Uh-huh. And, and you can tell because Joe was so he as as the of the end of the hunting uh or at the end of the hunt uh approach he got like desperate he mm-hmm. his pace goes like okay let's go this and let's go there and he will find yeah, you on the elk yeah more he aggressive will, i would say yeah, is the, is he, the right he, word yeah. he will he will yeah i mean uh, i'm not using the right word but every good, everybody good, can understand the, my lack of vocabulary but uh he will find you an elk. Yeah. He will. <laughs> and and I remember Louis shot an elk uh early that morning. And after Louis shot that that elk, uh all of a sudden we were looking for an arrow and and Joe told me, Manano, let's go. I mean it was like boom. I, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> and, and it was like like the seventh day of the of the hunt it was like they were one of the they were yeah they were talking a lot they were they were very talkative that, that morning. morning they they fired yeah. off that morning and yeah 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 and 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 joe told me manano let's go and i was okay <laughs> i remember it was a flat country uh and Joe, this is really let, let me let me let me say this. Joe, Joe goes like, "Hey, we were walking like I don't know, hour and a half, and I was so tired. <laughs> I was tired as hell." <laughs> and, and Joe kept like doing like, "Manano," and he and he 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 saw me like that, "Manano," and I said, "I mean, I don't know what he's doing." He he. He probably saying that he wanted to like uh, baseball high five or, 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 or something like that. that was... He's trying to tell me kiss his butt. I mean, what so, man? for the people for the people listening? It means get uh, on my six. Yeah, when when Joe pat his butt like that, it's just like you know get get right right behind me, get I, super yeah. close. close to me. Yeah, I, I was, want you I was, with me, man. Don't be slowing yeah. down. Yeah. We got to get moving. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. I, I was walking around, the I don't know, 25, 20, 20 yards away. And he and he goes like, Manano, hurry up, man. It was Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me tell you, this is this is a volcanic uh, rock. It's rough terrain, yeah. It's, I mean, it, even though it's flatland, it's, not a field it's of horrible. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's really... <sighs> It's really bad, uh, and uh, we he set me up on on uh, behind a little little uh, I don't know it was a pine tree or or it was a oak tree. Oak tree and, brush. And, yeah, and and it was a little one in the middle of the meadow, and he was calling in a bull, and the bull was the the, the bull were 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 talking really really hard. And uh, as an unexperienced uh, elk hunter, I I choose to to be at front in the front of the of the tree, but with a little detail that was the, the sun was in front of my face, and I was right. like totally white in the middle of a green meadow, and he right. was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was I was I mean he was like hundred yards and. Kind of a, he was trying to you know to to, to do like a V uh, setup. Yeah. Uh, so I was signaling like, to Manano to make a move. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and get he, out of the and, sun. And, and yeah. yeah, and and I was, and I was thinking, oh, he's doing the the elks are. He's telling me that the elks are coming. <laughs> 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 and after I don't know after, after a. Uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, probably more uh he decided to call me manano come here <laughs> yeah. as so as no I crow go, calling or two call no, elks no, calling no, no, it was no, like no. manano come here no no and i and i and i when i heard 
uh, Joe calling me like that, I said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as soon as I got there, he was like, okay, man, I'm when he said, okay, man, I know everything is bad. <laughs> you did it really bad. I, okay. He goes like, you have to kind of evaluate the situation, but you never go, go I mean, with the sun in front of you. You have to, to, to make the, 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 the you know, you, you, the, the you, yeah. You have to be behind of a, of a tree when you are trying to, to you know, to, to make a, a shot it's, it's, and, and, it's real tough in that type of terrain like that and a lot of it what he's talking about is like a scrub oak and you want to be on the side or someplace you don't want to be on the other side of it where you keep yourself from having uh, a shooting lane but yeah. you got to find those shadows to break you up so that you're just yeah. not shining out there when an animal comes up basically yeah 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 and and yeah and uh and he gave me that feedback and uh i said okay yo i got it and I just finished it to say I got it, and he was like 40 yards away. <laughs> and he goes back, Manano. <laughs> Smacking my butt again. Hey, can we have a discussion was, about what just, is that? Yeah, I was just drinking water, a little bit, stretching my, you know, my butt. And he was like, hey, come here. Putting on my perfume. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I reckon we walk, uh, I don't know, an hour at least. You guys were uh, out there because from the place where we split, when I heard over the radio that you guys had a uh, cow down and I started running to where you guys were at, it took me easily over two miles and I was trying to run through all that rock and it took me forever to get there, I felt. No, no, I mean, I, I can tell you, Joe can fly, <laughs> he flies. I mean, he, he doesn't walk, he flies. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. I'm he, getting old now, went... bro, don't worry, man. I'm slowly, slowing down. It was hot that day no, too, no, no. Man. It was hot too. Hot. Yeah. Yes. It was hot, yeah. And, um, but the bull was down. cranking, man. The cows were cranking and everything, oh. man. It was Yeah. Good. Yeah. I, I remember they were talking really it hard. 11 o'clock, and, uh, Joe? 11, almost noon? Yeah, it was it lit. It was, it, was that, it was that midday, man. It was midday. right around yeah. 10, 11 o'clock. Yeah. And... Well, they were talking. They were talking. Re I mean, they were talking a lot. And that's yeah, why, yeah, just, yeah. That's why uh, Joe kept calling them, calling them, and, and, and he walks, and, uh, and I said, hey, yo, I mean, do you want to come back? Because Luis, Luis just ha he just shot an elk, uh, you know, a couple of hours before, and I was worried about him, you know, finding his elk. And he said, "No, the bulls are talking. Let's go down." Oh my goodness! I I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Let's go down," and 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 it was kind of a. a it was it was a flat land, but with kind of with a, rolling you know, hills and yeah, yeah, and and beautiful. It was kind of a, it's, it's a it's a, like a stair stepped mesa with a yeah. lot of oak brush in different places and yeah. and, and really dead, deadfall big. and volcanic rock and very yeah. unstable uh, Vol you know, ground. And and we talk about this all the time. This is a type of place that people do not think about finding elk in. They really. drive and, right over it. And, yeah. yeah, that's right, yo. Uh, I was I was really uh, skeptical to find uh, elk down there because this was like a an open field with yep. little brushes and, and uh, I mean it was I was really skeptical but anyway he he goes he goes down and he said just hey hurry up and and, and all of a sudden <laughs> after I don't know forty five minutes an hour um, a bull. He was screaming like crazy, and right so, below us, man, right below us. Yeah, and uh, and Joe was like, "Get ready, Manano, get ready." And again, <laughs> I set up in the sun <laughs> <laughs> outside of the shade, right in the middle, and and he goes like, "Manano, get back, come back, man," and I was like. What are you doing, Joe? He was like <laughs> inside the tree, and and uh, the bull was 
walking around and it was a little it was like kind of a, a little park yeah right on the bushes yeah and uh we didn't see the bull but he was right there i mean that bull had to and be within after, 70 yards man just going off just screaming yeah off. 70 80 yards and just below and, like uh, in a little just, just a different elevation and all of a sudden uh a cow elk just came in mm -hmm. she came in like almost you know running and it is Stop in front. I mean, she stopped in front of us around, I don't know, 12, 15 yards. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, close, and, close. and, I, and I'm a full, <laughs> full draw. And I got Joe behind me, like. Right off your I shoulder. Know, I remember we were, I mean, I asked that question a uh, couple of nights before. And, and and how about the the chest shot and the shot the, the shot placement? I remember I Joe said you missed that conversation, man. I know the last podcast and whatever, but no, I'm sorry. It was and uh, and I remember I got that uh, that in my mind, and I was I did, I, I said no, I'm not taking that shot because it, even though it was really close. She was it was, like, a it was quartering a bit. It was yeah. a marginal shot, and you made the best decision. Yeah, yeah. and I did not take a shot. And I, uh, it, w it was almost, I got in the video, it was two minutes and, and 25 seconds. Full draw. The cow <laughs> was like standing like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dang, what is that? And, nice and I was doing? a full draw. Yeah, she's about two 12 yards, and, man. I mean, she's yeah, close. 12 I don't know. All of a sudden, she turns and she starts walking, and then she runs. And I remember Joe cow call a couple of time, times, in, and and she stopped. Uh, and and I remember Joe telling me it's 60, 62 yards. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Yeah, I know Joe. Said, Joe is a great guy, but I'm gonna measure it." <laughs> and I really <laughs> no faith, bro. No faith, man. Trust but, trust but verify. Yeah, yeah. I, I want you to hear the theme on this. Let's see. I didn't. I I was doubtful that there were elk down there. I was doubtful about getting the shadow, and I was doubtful that it was sixty-two yards. Yeah. Oh you my see what God. I deal with. A lot Joe. of faith. Did now, you now see I, what I deal with? Now I know why he named his yes. boy Thomas. I, oh, wow. Dou doubting oh, wow. Thomas right there, man. <laughs> oh yeah, Thomas. yeah, and I, and I, and I, I just believe. range it, and it was sixty-four actually. You're just two yards in front of me, I'm behind That's you. That's a different, Joe. We are talking bow hunting. Oh, I mean, it's not right. Yeah, it would have been six. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 man, wasn't right there, yeah. Joe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sixty-four yards. Oh, and, I'm sure uh, that two yards with your not even well. Well, anyway, she she was quoting away. Uh, she turns the head back, and Joe said, "Shoot it!" Send it. And as soon as I hear Joe giving me the green light, I let it fly. And 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 I I got that moment in my mind. I mean, the the the, the arrow flying like. You know the the, the mystical yeah. flight yeah. in the air. Slow mo, yeah. man. I mean, it was an um, it was an amazing an amazing moment, Joe. Mm -hmm. And I I Absolutely. hit um yeah the last on, rip mm -hmm. on the last rip, mm -hmm. and I remember I remember seeing blood coming out of the out of mm -hmm. the cow to the other side, and I just turn and I see Joe. <laughs> you gotta get ready. It's like Budkus when he yeah, hits he was you. more like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I would say fifteen seconds of exciting and then he go he comes with a feedback. <laughs> he goes like Manano. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> you did it Great again, job, huh? Manano. <laughs> yeah. I mean there's all in the bot. 
I mean, yeah, yeah. you did it again. Especially man. for us coaches, man. You, yeah. You, <laughs> One of my kids make just, a dive and play, and I'm like, you know, you could have made that a lot easier if you would. <laughs> I'm like, coach, I caught it. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Joe, Joe is not a guide. He's a coach. He's a hunting yeah. coach. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 yeah, it was like less than 15 seconds of excitement and, and celebration, and he goes like, manano. <laughs> now, and, and I knew I was in trouble again. <laughs> And he was like, you did it again, brother. You just <laughs> sit, you just sat right on the sun. There's, I mean, you got one, I mean, two feet that weighed off the shade. <laughs> why don't you go, why don't you go inside the shade, inside the tree? I mean, it's, it's more convenient, Manano. He was looking for the right word for me. To understand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't care, man. I'm eating elk meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was yo, yeah, yo, you lie, but he I mean, he no. made he made a beautiful Incredible shot, shot, man. It was a beautiful shot, unbelievable, the heck man. Of a and, shot. and and I what I want I want people out of that story. I want you to understand something that happened because we are talking about being able to hunt cows here. And I want you to even though we had a bull that was going nuts, why did that cow come up? And I'll tell you why because me and that bull were engaged. I was displaying, trying to pull his cows to me. I was doing display bugles to try to sound dominant so that I could get his cows to come to me and so that he would then follow his cows. And shoot, it just so happened that that cow, man, she heard, like we said up there before, who determines who's going to, you know, that cow determines who she's going to breed with, man. And yeah. when that cow hears a dominant bugle, I we don't know that bull that she was with could have been a two and a half, a three year old bull, uh, a young bull, and yeah. she hears this this deep raspy bull that sounds more dominant than mm -hmm. that bull that she's with. Well, she's going to head out of there, man, because she's going to go to another bull to Gold choose that. diggers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but but that's exactly what happened, and so this cow comes running into us man and it was running you know, it was at, really at, running at, and would have walked by us broadside except for there was a venezuelan dude sitting in the bright sun <laughs> right in front of me and that cow came around and she saw him like beaming like boom and she just stopped and looked at him like what the heck is she that was like man? diamond in a billy goat's butt <laughs> yeah you yeah. are far away <laughs> from your home <laughs> so, oh it was it was incredible it was an incredible and no story. the mafia was in the so, house so yeah. it was september that was september 10th yeah, yeah. it sure was and yeah. another thing about that that hunt again it was midday yep there was like 95 degrees yeah absolutely it was really and, hot. and the bulls are yelling and the cows are coming so you know keep that in mind too when you go back to camp and and, they, and, they, and so here's another thing, because I had a question um, that came to me um, from uh, a gentleman out of Arizona or that's going to be hunting Arizona. Charlie Newberry, he's, he's in northern Texas and he's going to go to Arizona. And he was asking about where the elk bed in, in a place where that is pretty much sloped. And you take where we were at here now. This area is hard for people to imagine unless you've been in an area like this, but it's it's kind of Mesa country that will go and it'll kind of like roll down and then roll down. And it's got on those sides, it has thick oak brush and stuff like that. But on top, there's all kinds of little oak brush patches mm -hmm. so that you really are unable to see. Man, sometimes you're not able to see 30 yards. Sometimes you're not able to see 50 mm -hmm. yards, right, in there. And those elk were bedded they were going to bed down they were bedded right in that area on top in the flat and they would go in the shade of the oak brush and bed down midday yeah. midday they they bedded down right in the same area that they yeah. eat, you know yeah they use, they use the shade like mm -hmm. like you wanted banana to use a shade yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so it's, it's I, been my experience in that country in that mesa type country that they use the shady sides of those ridges to bed down in i mean 
Yeah. Every time I've been up there midday looking in glass and when I'm on the Where cotton mesa or something brush. like that. Uh-huh. They're in yep. that they're and in that same thing like in, in those slopes of Arizona that got juniper, right? Yeah. I mean, that's all you see for miles is that mm-hmm. seven foot, eight foot of juniper. Yep. And those elk are in it, and they use that juniper. They're going to bed down in those areas, and uh, they're, they're going to do it in a defensive manner they're, as best that they can. And they can hear, smell, see, right, in that area. And, and almost all the time, they'll have a century. You know, they'll have they'll have one that's looking out for danger, you know. Yeah. Um, and they're bedded up on the front edge looking, you know, and they're <clears throat> constantly looking for danger. And it's what? usually one of the big lead cows. But they're also in those areas because they find that a lot of people don't hunt them in that stuff, yeah, man. No and if it wasn't for the fact that they scream bugles of uh, Arizona, man, you get there at the right time. Those guys are screaming. I mean, you I'm fine. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I know people have seen videos of, of a lot of those Arizona bulls. Take a look at the country, man. Oh, you know, man. you got that that juniper got that that short uh pinon pine and yeah it, it's just uh it's real yeah. scrubby looking you know out it there. looks like you can watch your dog run away for three days but it's not true you know it's not yeah as, absolutely there's a lot not. more coolies and little valleys in little there dips those, little rolls yeah. absolutely and and yeah. i don't care what kind of land you get on on the feature if if it does get rain it's going to drain and it's going to mm-hmm. drain in certain areas so yeah. there's always some areas that are lower than others right yeah. so some points when hunting cows because this is what it's all about and you for you guys that are looking for cow elk gilbert tell them the secret look guys the number one thing when you're hunting cows and hunting to find cows is elks are a slave to their bellies I've said this for a hundred years. I mean, seriously, elk are slaves to their bellies. And he and is that old. And feed, <laughs> rut, and late season. You know? Yeah, look, early season, rut, late season. You know, everybody thinks that, yeah, things change for the bulls where they go from early season to rut to late season. Because they're hanging with the boys early season, rut. They're looking for the ladies. And then yeah. late season, they're splitting off, man. So, yeah, things change for those bulls. But for those cows, if you want to find elk, if you want to find cow elk, you find the best feed, the best yeah. grass in those areas where they got good water, they got good eat, and you're going to you're gonna find cow elk. If you're not finding them in that area, there's a good chance they might rotate through that area because those yeah. the cows stay in big groups except for once they start getting split up by those bulls in the rut. But mm-hmm. they are still going to determine where they eat and where they bed, okay? Slaves to their bellies. If you're not hunting cow elk in September, you should be. Because that is the secret, man. That's EF mutton right there. <laughs> I, I like the, I like the, you know, your point about uh, you mentioned before about it's like they're normally in groups. Thus, you would know by there would be more tracks together. Sure. Um, so I, I, that's that's actually a, a one that caught my attention. Is like, oh, that makes sense. You know, if, it, if the cows are going to be in groups, you're going to see more tracks together. Absolutely. Um, and it's kind of here. feast and famine, man. I mean, yeah, they're easier to locate because there's more of them, so it's easier to spot than a lone bull someplace. When, when mm-hmm. you know, especially early before the bulls have started splitting them up, they're in big herds, man. And so yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's feast or famine with that, but it's a whole lot easier. They have to move. They have to get to different places. And early and late, so you take them early, they're going to be more patternable because they're going to go from their feed to their bed, feed to bed, and then they're going to go to the next feed and bed, just like that. Late season, man, if especially if there's snow on the ground, they're going to be oh, on those man. southern sides where it gets the sun more, where it gets windswept, where they can get to grass. They're going to move down if it gets too deep, and you can see tracks. So, And there's going to be there'll a be, lot of there'll tracks. There'll be tons of them. Yep. There'll be tons of them. They herd up in late season like big herds i mean a yep. couple hundred animals herd, you know so if you're early season if you're early season and you want to find uh, during the rut and you want to find cows listen for the bulls i'm going to tell you right where the cows are if you are late season and and i actually think the cow elk hunt to me is one of the easier hunts and the reason it's easier is because they are in that big group 
it's easier to spot that group i mean we've done a lot of cow elk hunts together right. with with people up there and i mean it's just sometimes like the whole hillsides moving. yeah and to, you know get up high and and uh just scope it out yep and uh they're easy to spot yep get let let your binos do the work for you find track look on those slopes they have to eat man because yeah. they have to give birth to a healthy calf they are going to eat 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 you know guys right now I, I sent you guys some video the other day of deer that i mean are, are right in my shooting munching right? down yeah <laughs> right munching down yeah oh. and and i i you should see the big buck, old the, fat the... swole up bellies oh huge belly <clears throat> and and when you see deer eating like that those elk are elk doing are the same thing, man. And these Bitch. guys are coming through by my house. They could care less. They're walking by my target. It, it's it's uh, it's almost <laughs> it's almost Tempting. funny, man. You know, and and all they're doing yeah. is eat, eat, eating. And that's the same thing those cows do at all time because they have to build that fat. Do you know that they will a certain percentage of protein or fat buildup in their body? If they don't have that, they won't ovulate, man. They can't give birth. So they have to build that that fat reserve so that they can survive or they won't give birth. It's yeah. just like deer. Yeah. Deer, if, they're, if they are pregnant and they have a terrible year where they're not going to be able to survive, yeah. they'll, they'll actually mm -hmm. – they'll they'll drop that baby early, man. You know, it's, uh, yeah. it's crazy how nature does that stuff. Well, so, in, in – and what you're saying is 100% true because it's nature's way of controlling population. If there's no food, then you can't get a cow to ovulate. Right. And so she can't, because she doesn't have any food means, well, you can't add more, more, uh, Bodies. you know, mouths right. to feed when there's not yep. enough food out there. So yeah, absolutely. That's God's yeah. way of handling it all. So yep. it's pretty cool. So using calls for elk, for rifle or archery, there's two things that uh, you want to use calls for. And that's either to locate or to pull them to you, all right? And when you hear us talking about locating, if it's during the, the September, like, like uh, one of our fellows is going to hunt, I'm not trying to locate the cows. I'm using yeah. location bugles and cow calls to locate the bulls. By me sure. locating the bulls, I'm going to know where the cows are. Find the cows. Are. Right? Yep. Okay. Whereas now... Um, the type of call now, if I do locate them and I want to pull a cow to me, again, I'm going to use sounds or calls that are going to either get them to want to participate or it's going to hit on their sense of um, uh, like being a mom, man, uh, like a yeah. lost, lost cow lost or a cow. lost calf lost. call. I'm going to put mm -hmm. that out there. Uh, that's going to hit their maternal instinct. And look, I'm telling you what, it's it's kind of like the Native Americans. You know, when they talk to people within their tribe, they always refer to an elder as grandma or, 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 yeah. or grandfather, grandmother or grandfather, or they have uncles. Everybody in that tribe is part of the family. And yeah. it's the same way with these elk. I mean, guys, just such a beautiful thought to me. I'm sorry. I, it just, it just, I, I just love that. And it's the same thing. It don't matter if it's an aunt, a grandma mom you know when there's a calf in trouble they're going to go to protect that calf and sure. it's not just the mom right they have they all have that maternal instinct so that law cast lost calf or cow call or that insistent buzz and a lot of people refer to that as the estrus call but that insistent buzz is kind of like um hey listen to me and then you follow it with a lost calf or or, or a lost cow it's kind of like, listen to me, I'm lost, right? <laughs> listen to me, get over here. You know, it's it's just um, a way of using that to get attention, uh, to to be insistent on what you're what you're trying to accomplish, guys. So, those are what, those are calls that the the mews and chirps, the lost cow or calf, the insistent buzz will work any time of year with a cow. Now. Do I walk around as a rifle hunter doing those and letting them know where I'm at? No, I, I don't. Uh, you go late October because the one fellow that's hunting on the 10th is going to have animal bulls screaming like crazy. But as it gets later, <laughs> it's be nuts. Yeah. right, as it gets to the end of October, oh, and, and you'll even November, you'll have bulls bugling that will tell you where the cows are. 
because there'll be young bulls in with that herd that'll do that, right? Um, but calls during September to late October, I'm going to use display or dominant bugles because I want to pull the cows my way. I'll use a lost cow or calf, or I'll use that insistent buzz. So those are things that you have some that are going to work all year round, and you have some that are going to work during the rut. And remember, if, if I want to use a location bugle to find a bull during September, I'm going to find a cow. All right? That's it. So uh, you, you guys, anything to add to that part before I go on to some other thoughts here? Because we're going to get ready to go to the mailbox. Okay. Remember, uh, Joe was the tree. Stay there. And he he was calling and he was doing just like a loss. I remember it was a loss, uh, lost cow. Uh, it oh. was a lost member. Uh, we got like I don't know, twenty cows and and and, and John cow running among right. us. Yeah. All of a sudden, and I was oh my goodness! I mean, it works. <laughs> it was it was it was a a. a a great moment, and I, I remember Luis passing on a big, huge mama. Don't give, argue. I give our, Don't argue. Yeah, I okay. got to give our boy props, man. He knew what he wanted. Um, I did the same thing for four years. You know, uh, passed on a lot of animals. Uh, I counted coup on a lot of them, and I wish I wouldn't have now. Uh, I'd have been a lot more experienced, but and things would have got easier. But look, I, I I appreciate that. You know, if that's exactly what he wanted to do, I mean that's that's our prerogative. For me, anymore, if I kill a big bull, it's that's kind of the coup de gras. For me, it's about hunting elk, and I don't discriminate. Cow gets in my way, she's gonna get it. You know, yeah. uh, I don't care if it's the first day or the last day. I hunt by a premise. Don't pass an elk on the first day. You'd shoot on the last day. So absolutely man i'm on I'm, if i get the opportunity i'm putting an error this hard what we do okay so it's not it's not easy so yeah i mean it, it's it's a big other side of the fence yeah he was but so long story short bull. long story short he let that one go and he killed the bull <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah yeah it all worked out in the it end it all worked it out is. in the end man yeah, um, before buddy. we go to the mailbox hey, there's hey, just two things i want to say Gil, before yeah, we get there yeah, is that good. just some other thoughts for you guys that are hunting cows and and that and actually this is a trick that uh, i learned from carl gamage uh, one of the toughest things when you kill a cow elk sometimes is the drag out if you're dragging or, or trying to get that elk moved or something. If, uh, if you will keep a horse harness in, in whatever you're using, if you're using an ATV or something like that, you can put that horse harness on that cow. In fact, I use it for bulls mm. whenever I'm having to pull a bull yeah. into a vehicle. And Truck, yeah. you can actually put, uh, we put little hook straps on that, on that mm. halter, and two guys can actually yeah. pull that animal and drag it fairly mm. well, man, uh, head first, which really helps you get through stuff instead of trying to pull by a leg or something like that if you're Ooh. actually trying to drag that whole animal out if you're yeah. not going to break it down right there and water I'll, it right there yeah that's yeah. good stuff joe yeah and the other that thing horse I'm halter gonna, works really good oh it, that halter is incredible man uh yeah. if if you know we use it on on the ranch where we hunt and i use it for bulls man and not I'll, I'll try to get close and hook that winch right up to that thing and man i can I can winch that that animal right up in. And the other thing yeah. I want to make sure that you guys know is that um, make sure that you know what the law requires as far as proof of sex with that cow elk. Yeah. If it generally some states, if it's either sex, um, they have you know you have to do a skull cap uh, like here in New Mexico. Um, if it's just a cow elk hunt. Um, but make sure you know what your what your laws are as far as that goes ahead of time. You don't want to be all happy and excited and have a great moment happen only for it to go sour because of uh, yeah. you know, something like that. Uh, that's super valid, Joe, and I think it's something that um, 
you know, also try to tag as quickly as possible because within the heat of them, I mean, you, you're excited, you're celebrating and you forget to tag the animal and then you can get in trouble for that. So absolutely keep that yeah. in mind too. It's yep. uh, yeah, it's super important. Yeah. And sometimes it's just that, you know, uh, you have to just punch your tag, you know, do different things. So uh, make sure you know your requirements so that those great moments stay like great moments. OK, we're going to go to our Elk yeah. Girls mailbox yeah. and, you know, we're, we're going on time here. We've really enjoyed this, but uh, we're going to try to knock some of these out. And I think next time, our next show, we're going to have to really pretty much base our show on a lot of questions from the mailbox because they are yep. stacking up, man. Um, I'm going to awesome. take the first one from Chad Borowski out of Ver Vermont. He says he's been listening to our podcast for a while now and wanted to take a minute. He wanted to say thank. He loves the content. He says his two-year and five-year-old are constantly running around the house bugling and cow calling. And his uh -huh. two-year-old's first word, his two-year-old's first word was elk. Oh, that's man. awesome, yeah. Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's Talk so cool. about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think that's cool, man. So he says, um, awesome. likely related um, to the amount of time he spent in the car listening to your podcast. My wife and I live in Vermont and are both healthcare professionals. We are both wondering if we missed a podcast episode on backcountry hunting, first aid, or if you first plan aid. on doing one in the future. And we have hmm. talked a little bit about first aid, but I think that is something that we would really like to do on one of our, on one of our, uh, it's a great uh, idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah one of our focus on safety, yep. safety topics, you know, in general, Absolutely. that's yep. a great idea. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we have not, and that's a great suggestion. I think we're going to try to do that for you. Okay. You um, did. next up, yeah. we got, uh, Heath Gibson from May Pearl, Texas. Uh, he says, uh, I have a question about elk urine and droppings. How long does it stay fresh in drier climates like Southern Colorado where uh, you can smell it or how long do the droppings stay soft? It seems that the smell would dissipate and the droppings would dry out faster than down in Texas. What do y'all think? Mm. They're gonna dry out quick in Texas. I can tell you that it's hotter yeah. than Hades down here. It's yeah. hot, but it's moist. Yeah, but it's hot, brother. It'll take the moisture. Right no, it's there. really the hot. It'll take the moisture just... out of a turd and a snap of a finger. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, it's freaking hot, and it's a hundred. It's a hundred plus percent humidity down here too, Joe. Yeah, that's what's yeah. wild. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, I grew up around cows all my life, and it don't take long for a cow chip to become a cow chip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Oh. So Heath, one mm -hmm. thing that I'll tell you, man, is when you come across that fresh, fresh, it depends on how moist that It'll year spin. is as to how um, how much that that uh, those droppings. You know, there's a lot of times those droppings that are fresh, fresh, you can smash that with your foot and it's almost the texture of like acrylic paint, you know, squeezing yeah, out of like a, a tube. Paste. It just, just mashes mm -hmm. real good, mm -hmm. right? And uh, yep. um, then... Yeah, the drier it is, usually the older it is. Well, and, um, and it's uh, real light green. Yeah. Yeah, pretty what, light green. Yeah. And, and yeah. then it mm -hmm. starts to darken. Darken. You know, yeah. and by the next day, it's kind of turned into brown. like a, a, a greenish, darkish brown. And mm -hmm. uh, brown. yeah, and and you can tell, like, I got a degree in crap, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can kind of tell. As, yeah, if you're putting your foot on it and you're smashing it and it comes apart, like with a lot of uh, grass in it, like really dry. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's really old stuff right there when yeah. it gets like that. So um, uh, the, the urine, urine will be fresh on the ground. You'll see it. It'll be, yeah. you know, it'll be a wet spot. You yeah. Know, uh, if it's fresh, it's fresh, fresh. And sometimes you can still smell the urine after a, a little bit, but, mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on what happens weather-wise. There's so many variables that do that. And even bedding areas, man, bedding areas where they bed down a lot, Man, it can mm -hmm. that scent can stay in there for a week, man. I mean, it can. 
yeah, it it's just uh, it just starts to reek. Uh, Strong. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. On there. Yeah, and you know when you find a bedding area, it's going to reek like that because every time they get up, they they urinate. You know, so I mean, it's it's part of their mantra, just like us when we get up. I mean, it's part of it. They've slept for a while and they get up, they urinate, and. <clears throat> I've I've noticed too that when I'm in the woods and I find places that are have a whole lot more smell, generally there's more than one elk there. It's been a herd that come through, and they all urinate in that one area, and it gets really loud, you know. Yeah. And you turn yourself into the wind, and it so most of the time, man. I mean, you, if you can smell them that loud, you you're not far behind them at all. And and I tell you guys, if if you smell elk like because they smell a lot like their urine, there's a reason for that, right? Yeah. So if you smell elk and you start moving into it, you know, with the wind in your face, and all of a sudden that scent disappears, all you gotta do is start looking around because I guarantee it's urine down on the ground. Okay. Uh, yeah. If if yeah. you move so far and you're still smelling that, you got elk ahead of you. And I tell you what, oh, if you're smelling, <laughs> if if you're smelling them strong. Um, they yeah. could be within 100, 200 yards. So be very careful yeah. when you're smelling that. As yeah. soon as I smell elk strong, <clears throat> man, I'm stopping. I'm looking Bing. into the wind. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm looking into it. <coughs> and and I'll, t- I'll give you another tip. When you guys are walking in anywhere in life and you smell a scent that is strange to you, turn and locate. I mean, yeah. if you smell cigarette smoke, notice the wind, turn and locate. If you smell a, a yeah. perfume, notice the wind, turn and locate. If you smell uh, that anything, one's easy. You just look at Manano. <laughs> <laughs> you smell Brute by Fabergé. Always, Manano's always in the woods. Manano. That's right. <laughs> next, next letter. Okay, the next question comes from Enrique Mora from Vancouver, Washington. He, he asks, this being my very first year archery hunting for anything, I have no experience and I am a little overwhelmed with the options for broadheads. As I learned from listening to you guys, I know that I want fixed cut on contact blade, not mechanical. Good. So can you guys please let me know what you use for broadheads so I can never well, everybody's well, staying quiet, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, hey. I was going to let Beto. I wanted to give the Beto master the Joe a time. Uh, look, I'm telling you, you can't go wrong with three different broadheads that I'm going to recommend. And Joe shoots one of them made from Wasp. It is a fantastic head. It's been around for a long time. Joe, what's the what's the the uh, the the Wasp? Uh, so I I shoot I either shoot the 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 hammer SST stainless steel yeah, 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 the hammer yes. I like the sound of that it's a one twenty five yeah. grain uh, or yeah. or I shoot the boss and and the boss is just a little mm-hmm. bit smaller but it's a one twenty five and it's got great cutting yeah. penetration on it yeah. too so those are the two that that I use. Look, Wasp been around for a long time. I've been a fan of Muzzy forever. Killed a lot of animals with a Muzzy uh, Trocar and a Muzzy MX3. Uh, fantastic heads. I this to this day I shoot a Bloodsport uh, Reckoning. Uh, it was when it originated. It came out from a guy named Terry Hartcraft. It was called uh, the Hartcraft Deep Cut. Now Bloodsport bought them, uh, Pradco bought them, and it's the deep cut reckoning uh, from Bloodsport. I shoot it because it flies the best in my setup, and it penetrates like none other. And These you guys just said, have all been Gilbert, you just said ahead. the key too, man. <clears throat> I, I what you just said, I want you to repeat. That's what flies the best in your setup, right? Yeah, and, and and when I say that, I'm saying that because as guys that shoot bows that are. I would say top end, top of the line bows. We shoot a very fast arrow, right? And we shoot a heavy arrow. I shoot a big full metal jacket arrow. Uh, It's super duper heavy. I mean, my KE, I pull 72 pounds. The KE is around 89 to 90 pounds of KE. So, I mean, it's a hammer. I'm a 31 inch draw. I mean, we shoot big bows and, and they fast. So for us stabilizing a broadhead at distance, most of the time, 20 to 40 yards, you're really not having a lot of problems. But stabilizing these broadheads at distance has been uh, has been the problem for us. So this deep cut broadhead that we shoot is just fantastic. And yeah, look, it, it kills animals. Yeah, the, the, I agree with you. I mean, obviously my setup, uh, it was developed after, after Beto, but one of the things is too, if you do find a good fixed cut and contact broadhead yes. that you like, uh, one of the things that you can do to evaluate with your setup is to understand 
um, out of your bow, how is that arrow turning and what kind of fletchings you need to have in order to make sure that you stabilize your arrow for your broadheads that's too. Right. So it may take a little bit of tuning, but uh, again, that's why he specified it for his setup and our set of mine and Manano, that's what we use and it works great for us. Yeah, it's been good. So, and, and I'll tell you, Enrique, you know, uh, a, a good cut on contact, um, uh, a broadhead that flies well with your setup and you know that has any kind of history on it as being solid you can do reviews on just about it and i know it gets mind-boggling but I, I can tell you any of the ones that we that we've told you would most likely fly good in your setup um if you're if you're shooting i would tell you if you're shooting a lighter arrow for speed i would go with a heavier um a broadhead on the top if you're going with a heavy arrow that's going to give you that killing power then you can look at that that lighter broadhead because of, of what you got. So um, any of those is going yeah, to work Yeah, we shoot the 100 you, grain. Yep. Yeah, we you shoot can. the 100 grain, and we're we're some somewhere in the name of in the neighborhood of 279 to 285. Yeah. Uh, when we're looking at you know feet per second. So, yeah, and that's about uh, you where know, I'm at. And, yeah, and, and I'm shooting a 125 with a lighter, you know, with a 350. Yeah. So. Right. And if you, if you guys are, you know, I don't know what bow you're shooting brother, but if you're shooting a recurve or something like that, you want something heavy, like a big Zawicki or a buzz a Magnus buzz cut. I mean, something of that neighborhood. So uh, it just really depends on your setup. Joe, you got anything else, brother? No, sir, man. That's a, We're going to cut that and save the rest of them for next time. Sounds good. Well, fellas, as usual, guys, if you like what we're doing out there, please subscribe, rate, and review. You got to go to Apple Podcast or Apple iTunes and review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And a reminder to our listeners, you know, if you'd like your questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com unbelievable show teaching these guys how to find the cows by finding the bulls almost in reverse of what we talk about yep. joe it's been yep. fantastic stuff like you said these questions keep racking up man so cool to have the venezuelan mafia in the house uh our counselor and guy to the north up there manuel gratron and you know luis gonzalez our boy to the west over here in Katy, texas <laughs> always good to have those guys in the house Chav, so good to see you up and around. I can't wait. Going to see you guys here in just a few weeks. So um, thank everybody out there for, for listening. We appreciate all the love and the support we get, all the emails and stuff like that. Y'all keep sending them. We'll keep knocking them out of the park. As we say down in heck, here in Texas, husbands kiss your wives. Wives kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Peace, peace, everybody. Peace. Welcome to Blue Hitter. Hunters. <laughs>